And this is what I played for him. Hello, this is Cuckoo Town and I'm your host, Mark Anthony Wyatt. Our intention here is to serve you up a delicious smorgasbord of strange, all that weird stuff that we know you love too. With the assistance of my co-host Janice and occasional guests, we'll also be delving deeply into an indefinable place, a liminal space where high strangeness meets high creativity. The place where the magic happens, where the spark that gives us inspiration abides and the muse resides. Hello, Mark here at Cuckoo Town. We're a little bit behind at the moment on releasing new episodes as we've been extremely busy recently painting our house taking advantage of the last of the warmer weather this year and more recently we've been traveling by car across the usa from illinois to california very tiring it took us three days but wow what a road trip america is so beautiful it takes your breath away sometimes anyway enough of me rambling i've got three fascinating interviews to be released in the next few weeks which i'm sure you will enjoy but in the meantime here's a quickie that i hope you will enjoy too it's an essay uh, that i wrote about the sense of place and creativity and it's titled donovan creativity and a sense of place i hope you enjoy it The roll call of imaginative, creative people born and raised in Cornwall, or in even more cases, those who originally came from outside Cornwall, but heard the creative call to relocate and work there, is impressive. Within the last hundred years or so, it's been a veritable who's who of world-renowned talent. Off the top of my head here, in no particular order, are a random few of those gifted people. D.H. Lawrence, Winston Graham, Alistair Crowley, Peter Lanyon, Brian Winter, Sven Berlin, Philip Pesseltine, Daphne du Maurier, John Betjeman, Bernard Leach, Catherine Mansfield, Charles Corsley, Rosamund Pilcher, William Golding, Barbara Hepworth, Colin Wilson, Brian May, Charles Dickens, Dennis Vell Baker, Ralph McTell, J.M.W. Turner, Alfred Wallace. This list could go on and on and on. So my apologies to all the talented people that I won't be mentioning. All I'm trying to get over to is that Cornwall has always punched well above its weight, creatively speaking. Dennis Valbaker, in his book The Seas in the Kitchen, told us how a simple trip into town, St Ives, came in the 1950s, early 1960s, would inevitably entail him bumping into sculptors, writers, artists, poets and musicians, many of which would go on to become household names in later years. Penwith, an ancient region, known as a hundred in that part of the world, in the far west of Cornwall, always drew these creative, talented people, just as nectar has always lured bees. But it's more than that. There's a certain magic at work in this part of Cornwall, centred on the St Ives and Zena area. It's a highly evolved sense of place, and no other regions of Britain could also lay claim to be in a hotbed of talent, and many, quite rightly, do. But Cornwall, I'm convinced, has the edge per square mile. It seems to offer artists an apprenticeship, a rite of passage, if you like. So many of our most creative people have done their lifetime's best work whilst living in Cornwall. The Scottish songwriter, musician, poet Donovan is but one example of how the Cornish spirit influences creative people to go west as far as they can in southern England. His call to Cornwall, and Penwith in particular, came in 1963. Donovan had heard on the beatnik generation grapevine that Cornwall was the place for young creatives creative people to live and work. And so, along with his friend Gypsy Dave, Donovan hitched a ride. No, not on the Marrakesh Express, but on a slightly less glamorous British version from St Albans in England, where he had mostly been raised, down to Cornwall, which had no doubt entailed several lorry, van, motorbike and car rides down the old A1 road, before eventually joining on to the A303 to head west on the Highway to the Sun. It was in St Ives, in the shadow of its lofty, granite-encrusted Cairns, Trencrom and Rose Wall, as he hung out around the town and on its golden beaches, that Donovan's gift of finger-picking guitar and storytelling in his deep, distinctive brogue, where his talents were nurtured. Donovan was influenced by American talents, people like the musicians Rambling Jack Elliott and Woody Guthrie, and the writer Jack Kerouac, 
but increasingly too, I suspect, by the unique Cornish spirit that rises through the granite, affecting anyone with any creative talent, dormant or active. Donovan strode confidently around the magical town, a town that had long been a magnet to many creative types. He had the image of an impish Pied Piper, with his acoustic guitar, colourful hippie clothing, beads, bangles and his long, curly, Celtic locks. Donovan may not have been a big man, but he was already, by the early 1960s, like Cornwall itself, punching well above his weight, creatively speaking. Gypsy would later remark that his friend had a special magic that enchanted people. Donovan loved his brief time in St Ives, hanging out with his new beatnik friends, sleeping rough on Porthminster Beach under the vast canopy of stars at night, in the coastal beach shelters beneath Penn Over Hotel, and occasionally in the dark, creepy woods that lie beneath the Tregenna Castle Hotel. Donovan would return to St Ives just three years later in 1966, having now found fame, if not yet fortune, in London, starring in a documentary for the BBC, A Boy Called Donovan, where he re-enacted for the cameras his earlier visit to the small Cornish town. Two of the extras in that film, playing a couple of Donovan's beatnik mates, were Demelza and Martin Velbaker, and their father, as you may have already guessed, was Dennis Velbaker, a prolific short story writer who lived in the town at that time. He had chronicled the exploits of many artistic people in the area via his Cornish Review magazine, which had showcased work by local poets, writers, artists, musicians and other creatives. Donovan's time in St Ives ensured he would evolve into being more than just your average one-hit wonder, disposable pop star. He would evolve to become part musician, part poet, part philosophy teacher, writing songs that promoted world peace, spiritual truths. And he would work with other great talents of his era, people like the Beatles, the Stones, Led Zeppelin. Donovan, in his earlier creative days, was in Dylan's immense creative shadow, one of the drawbacks of belonging to such an incredibly gifted generation, born out of the chaos of war, the antithesis of destruction. He was occasionally cruelly cast as a Dylan copyist, but nothing could have been further from the truth. Perhaps it was just bad timing on his parents' behalf. Donovan was influenced by many diverse musical genres, and those influences would all gradually come out in his music as the years rolled on. He was no one-trick pony, never afraid to experiment. His musical canon includes jazz, psychedelia, rock, folk, pop, blues, funk and world music, notably Indian, Calypso and Latin. The passage of time and later generations of music lovers, without the prejudices of my own generation and earlier music media, will ensure that his diverse music and legacy will endure. Donovan's work has, perhaps only in more recent years, begun to re-emerge from behind Mr Zimmerman's huge artistic shadow. I hope so. He deserves far wider recognition. Donovan was always very much his own man, walking his own path, on a journey that had first begun on the day he'd put Kerouac in his rucksack, picked up his guitar and left St Albans for Cornwall. In the tradition of the Greek muses, Donovan had stood on the little wall that surrounds St Nicholas's Chapel on the island at St Ives, looking out over the Atlantic Ocean, when he had heard the wind blowing through his acoustic guitar strings. Intrigued by the weird, ethereal sounds emanating from his guitar, Donovan lifted it up, high above his head, like a sacrificial offering to an ancient pagan deity in the nearby hills, to capture the sound of the wind. He caught more than the wind that day. He had, albeit briefly, captured the very essence of Cornwall. The bewitching melody of Catch the Wind is now as timeless as Cornwall itself. A fine example of how the spirit of Cornwall has always influenced creative people in their literature, art and music. In this short essay, I have tried to do the impossible, and that was to put into words the way that Cornwall, and specifically the Far West Pen Whiff area, influences creative people. It's not the wonderful views, the wild moorland, the misty carns, or the craggy cliffs, and it's not the special light, but so many books on Cornwall and its artists will tell you lures them into this tiny rocky peninsula that sticks out into the Atlantic like a pointy finger. Although all these things do, in different measures, play their part. No, it is more than that, much more. It is, as I intimated earlier, an ethereal, invisible, unknowable spirit that exudes from a granite that underpins the Penwith landscape. It seeps into receptive, talented artists, writers, poets and musicians. It's what Sven Berlin called the magic shuttle, something that we tune into when we're in the zone, but inspires us to create. Ah oh, well.
It appears that I'm still unable, like hundreds of writers before me, to fully capture the elusive quality of this Cornish atmosphere that I'm trying so hard to put into words. As Donovan himself realised back in 1965, when I was still just a skinny kid wearing shorts, it's a futile quest. We may as well just try to catch the wind. Thanks for listening. See you next time when we'll take another stroll down a road less travelled. Be lucky. Be lucky. Jack of Diamonds, Jack of Diamonds.